Half of 2023 has come and gone. Some absolutely phenomenal games have been released. But of these, which is truly worthy to be called Game of the Year? To tackle such a huge topic, we had to call in reinforcements. And who better to chat about Game of the Year than the man, the myth, the absolute legend, Michael Heim, Senior Editor at GameSpot. Listen on for our mid-year 2023 Game of the Year predictions. This is the 20M Podcast. And with that, everybody, <laughs> hello. Welcome to the 20M Podcast. It is so good to see you all. Um, my name is RF, everybody. Welcome to the 20M Podcast, the podcast about video games and deep diving into video games and the people behind them. Uh, my name is RF. Did I say that already? Did I already mess up yeah. the like, <laughs> intro? No, it's the first time. Just, it was. Yeah, no, no, just go for it. It doesn't matter. I'm going to keep, <laughs> we're gonna keep, keep rolling. rolling with it because I have my amazing co-host with me here today. Uh, Reno, how are you, Reno? It's good to see you. I'm good. How are you? And today we are joined by a special guest. I'm pointing Michael? this way. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where Michael's going to be in the vicinity. <laughs> hey. Michael Heim. How are you, Michael? It's good to have you here. I'm doing good. I'm I'm super stoked to be here. This is dope. Uh, I love chopping it up with different people around the world and connecting with my peoples too. You know what I'm saying? So uh, <laughs> this is this is great. And uh, yeah, I just I love I love being on podcasts, chopping it up with different people. So uh, I'm really I'm really glad that y'all reached out. Uh, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah. It's so it's so lovely to have you here, but I just want to pause and say like chopping it up on a podcast. Like again, talk about like Southeast Asian stuff, right? Like that's just a mindset. It's like we're all in the kitchen, like making some fried rice oh, or something. Yeah, yeah, like sure. we're just chopping up some stuff. <laughs> chopping it up. Oh, so Welcome well, to the 20th podcast, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Like where we cook some in the kitchen talking about food and video yeah. games from Southeast Asia. Um, no, Michael, seriously, lovely to have you. And for those that don't know, I guess like we know you from your coverage on games and featured in a lot of, you know, reputable and obviously some of the biggest sites in the world. Um, but Michael, please, like for the people that don't know, the poor listeners living under a rock <laughs> and the, you know, listening to the 20 Up podcast where they're the, we're the only media that they consume. You know what I mean? Like okay, okay. what's uh, yeah. what's the intro to, to Michael, the Michael Heim? Sure. Uh, so I... I'm a senior editor at GameSpot now. I've been at the site for a cumulative amount of about six and a half years at this point. Uh, we started in 2016, and then I left to go to FanBite. Um, they offered me, they, you know, they came through with the bag. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> and that was great. I, I got to work with so many uh, really dope people. But uh, unfortunately, as things go in media, the depressing side of it is that Parent companies aren't usually happy with how sites are run. And when that happens, they start to gut that site. And that's what happened to Fanbyte. And you see it happen frequently around other sites. So I freelanced for a while and then I eventually came back to GameSpot because uh, all my friends still work there. So recently, it's been a couple months since I've been back. And everyone, I go into the office here in San Francisco and it's like, oh, these are all the people that I worked with for the past, like when I started. So uh, it's rare to see that kind of longevity at a site. And so GameSpot is a very special place for me because also that was, that was my homepage growing up as a kid when I first got <laughs> my computer. And like when I went to the library before my family could afford a computer and internet oh and all that, God. I was like, oh, GameSpot.com was my was my website. So, so wild. yeah, it is, it is wild to kind of uh, be a part of that for so long at this point. But yeah, I'm uh, based out here in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I originally grew up in Southeast San Diego where that is the highest concentration of Filipino Americans. And I moved <laughs> to San Francisco and now I live in Daly City, which is the city with the second highest density of Filipino Americans. <laughs> so I'm uh, very predictable in that sense. I didn't like outright choose, but I was like, oh, we can move to Daly City. Hell yeah, let's go. Seafood City and Jollibee is right, right around the corner. So. <laughs> I was gonna say like there must be like some subconscious thing you're like looking up yeah. like Uber Eats or whatever in that area. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, there's a jolly be here. I feel like that'd be a good place to live. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh man, but yeah, it's uh, it's nice to I hear like Tagalog being spoken around me. Like my half my or more than half my building is all Filipino families. So I'm just like, oh yeah, it's like being back at my grandma's house growing up. So uh, I'm always uh, being part of the like staying connected to my culture has been always been very important to me. Um, and like growing up in high school, like. More than a third of the of my community and the people I went to school with were Filipino Americans, and we were the first program. Uh, Shasta to Morse High School were the first program to have uh, Filipino language classes as part of oh, the American wow, uh, education system. So yeah, so uh, salutes to Ginong and Ginong Idos. Uh, they're the they're the OGs. But but yeah, that's uh, 
you know, I'm, I live in America, but I have a lot of love uh, and a lot of connection to uh, the motherland. So, yeah. I, I will exclusively refer to Malaysia as my motherland. No, mm-hmm. it was like, the, I'm sorry, guys, I need to go back to the motherland. Really quick. <laughs> the whole, like TGS is over. I'm heading back to the motherland. Yep, yep. No, but like, like jokes aside, it's like, I just think it's awesome because for those that have been long, long time listeners of the 20M podcast, you know, we were just talking about this before the show, but we've always been centered around, you know, uh, Reno and I's personal work, but also a little bit of the stuff that we embed here in the podcast is about highlighting Southeast Asian voices. And for me, it's like, dude, super cool that we get to highlight, you know, developers on the show before. And we work with a couple like Southeast Asian publishers and, and developers, but also just gets like some Southeast Asian voices uh, in the on the media side. You know what I mean? So yeah, hell yeah, uh, thank you. I think it's awesome. Um, I I was gonna make a joke about Southeast Asian food, but I feel like it's such low hanging fruit that like was well, that gonna, we was to that challenge joke him well? to a battle? We like we were like two of us on the Malaysian side, and then like Michael on the Filipino side. Like who actually has the best food? Was that? Oh, it? absolutely. We should do that with every <laughs> Southeast Asian guest. You know oh, what I mean? we're it's gonna like, fight. Who was the better? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine we get somebody from like a, a game dev from Singapore. Like what's what's Brian? Is Brian gonna defend Singaporean food? No, he couldn't. Food? No, he couldn't. <laughs> uh, <I laughs> Singaporeans defending Singaporean food, like. <laughs> Yeah, but, well, what's, but, what's, but, but what's like the staples though? Like I, I guess, I don't know. What, what's like staple Malaysian food? Yeah, like when you go to a family party, like what's because for Filipinos it's always like lumpia pancit, um, and like everyone loves everyone loves lumpia and pancit, and then everyone, that's what everyone knows. Yeah. But like you gotta go Adobo. deeper, gotta get into the dinaguan, <laughs> you gotta get into the the palabok, like all the all the all the wild stuff that only mom knows how to make. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go niche with you because like w- this whole conversation, for those that are sticking around for our Southeast Asian shenanigans, which you should because this is like for the core mm-hmm. essence of the podcast, right? We will be talking about games of the year and like some niche games as well potentially that we think deserve the game of the year stuff. But this is a similar conversation with food games. because – No, no, no. But there stuff. is like – like, so you're talking about like game of the year stuff, right? It's like, okay, Starfield is kind of like your Nasi Lama, which is like the Malaysian kind of like national dish, if you will, right? But okay. then you also have like, hey, look at this little like kueh matmor, you know what I mean? Which is just like a little – I don't even know what it is. It's just like a powdery ball that like dissolves in your mouth that's made up of like ghee i guess um and like that's like your indie hit of the year so i'm gonna go with like <laughs> a little a little bit of like a small tiny koi mat more i think i think that's how you'd say it oh, no okay. um yeah. i will go with like did you say no to my thing no <laughs> like, i said no i like, know that that, that is, that's blatantly incorrect um i will go with curry puffs so like oh. they're, just, they're like you know flaky pastry instead there's like a kind of like curry thing with like potatoes and chicken and things like that because my family literally like had like world war ii amongst us because someone ate the last curry puff and didn't tell anyone didn't split it didn't share and it was like made by like one of our like great aunts and she only does it like twice a year or something because it's like labor intensive and she's old and it was just it was was just like this weekend where it was so like cold and really like not sociable in the house because everyone was really upset last curry puff that's like, oh, that, that could that's be a, that yeah, that's kind of sad. No, like, I'm so sorry. Game, you know, uh-huh. like there's like one curry puff there, and it's like a battle royale style game where like everyone's trying to like go in for it. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why we're on the media side and we don't make games. <laughs> it's like we Aww. we pitched uh, our publisher friends like, hey guys, this curry puff battle royale game <laughs> <laughs> featuring Southeast Asia would be great. Yeah, they're like, what, uh, what was your? Like, oh wait, what were you saying? You you were, were you going to set up for a joke there that I completely like ruined? <laughs> oh no, I was just going to say them. like. Uh, Good luck getting a publisher to give you money for that. <laughs> mark, mark my words, Michael and Arif. This time next year, we're going to be discussing Game of the Year, the Curry Puff Battle Royale. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Man. My, what, what, before we move on for the full food conversation, Michael, what was your, what was your deep cut food like take? You know, Oh, for Filipino food? Yeah. Uh, well, I did mention Dinaguan because I think that a lot of people kind of shy away from like if you tell someone what Dinaguan is, then they're like, oh, shit, no, nah, no, nah, I'm, yeah, I'm not eating that. It's um, it's chopped pork. Uh, so like uh, you can use different cuts of pork, but usually it's like pork shoulder, pork belly uh, cooked in mm-hmm. pig's blood. So uh, oh, you, 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 yeah, you, you cook it down for like a really long time and then the blood turns like a dark purple and it, tur- it gets a little grainy. So it turns into like a soup. Um, oh, so you yeah. have the chopped bits of pork in the pork, the pig's blood, and it's also seasoned with like garlic, ginger. Um, it's very salty, and a lot of Filipinos have gout <laughs> problems, so a lot, our food doesn't do us <laughs> many favors, if any. Um, but man, I, I love some like dinner. You need to eat it with white rice. So uh, yeah, it's a, a very like vinegar. A lot of our food is vinegar heavy, so uh, including dinaguan, but. Ooh man, you know the, the, the aunties would all and uncles would say, "Oh, it's chocolate 
it's chocolate pork. And that oh. is to, Do you like, not, eat it? Yeah, to not tell the kids oh what it God. is. Cause he's like, <laughs> wow. if I go to listen, son, this thing is cooked in pig's blood. Boom. Yeah. Have that. And it's like, ah, I don't know, but it's like, Oh, it's chocolate rice. It's, or it's chocolate, it's chocolate pork. Rice. Yeah. yeah. Like, welcome to the 20th podcast, the podcast about video games and like childhood trauma <laughs> living in Southeast <laughs> mm-hmm. Asian, like households or TS for households. Um, <laughs> I gotta I try it. it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. look that up. I'm, I'm sure there's like some niche Filipino restaurant here in Tokyo where like a Japanese man went to the Philippines, like studied the craft for 20 years, came back and is like open a Filipino restaurant. That's like the story everywhere. I'm sure, yeah. I'm fine here. Oh, yeah. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trust myself to cook that though. That, that, that's all. Uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely like cooking i feel like cooking southeast asian food is a whole different like ball game as well you know mm-hmm. six hour like there anyway enough about enough about that everybody we're a word <laughs> video games podcast where we obviously like to celebrate culture and i think all that conversation is obviously super important but for us it's like uh what is going on with the 20m podcast today and reno to that i say that is a big flipping episode because we got michael with us and we've got you and we've got me, <laughs> which are two ingredients well, that usually are the same anyway. But what I was going to say is that um, I think for us is like halfway through, we're halfway through the year. Like it's been pretty reflective over the past couple of months. I remember like, I think for us, we've just been complaining about how busy we've been since uh, Summer Game Fest. And like the caveat being like, we didn't, we weren't there. We weren't like flying around and covering the stuff, but it was still pretty like video we're game. We're just up until three in the morning, sitting in our computers, being exactly. like, trying to, trying to like stay alive, trying to like stay awake. Exactly. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a rough. It was a rough week. But yeah, we've and been the, like super busy. I was gonna say, and the existential dread has led us to like think about life a little bit more. But also, and by proxy, think about what are the best games of the year? Because I feel like those two questions are pretty hand in hand. They go hand. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, without further ado, we're gonna we're gonna kind of cover like our top top contenders for game of the year. Also, just like games that we've loved in general. Um, who here wants to go first? So, so this is a this is a really interesting one. Um, I think I'll, I'll kick it off, right? I'll start. I'll start with right. a nice like. I think this will be on your list at least for sure, you know. Mm-hmm. But my and I guess like the we'll we'll circle around. We'll we'll rotate between like people's answers here. But I want to put forth my personal one of my personal games of the year and what I also think deserves like a lot of credit that I'm not sure it will get. Buddy. <laughs> is like, a space for the unbound for by Indonesian developers Mojikin Studio and Sergey Productions, um, and it's this, uh, it just like some caveats here. That's the second game that we covered here in the Twenty M podcast. Reno and I did work with Sergey Productions to do a little bit of a promotion for the game. Hyper caveat: Yes, my name is in the credits for the game. <laughs> It's it's it originally that was going to be a flex, but the second part of it is I only beta tested the game, so it's not like I really did like yeah. much there. But take that with uh, as what you will. Um, so I've been around this game for a long time, but I, I do love this game. But yes, a space for the unbound is my like contender for one of the games of the earth that I want to put forth. Um, before I get to maybe some of my thoughts as well, Rito, Michael, you both have obviously. I'm assuming mm-hmm. we've all. Play the game. Yeah. Played the game. I, mean, I was going to say love the game. I don't know, actually. Oh, yeah. I love this game very dearly. And I think the one of the first, I think maybe the first time I saw it was when you covered it, Reno. I think you had covered it with Games Hub. Yes, and that's I how did. I started. I noticed it. And then I was I started like reading a little bit. I was like, all right, I'm already so like got to play this game. Um, and yeah, I played it and... Uh, I guess I'll just say off the top that very few games affect me at this level. Like I cry about games a lot and often and like, I get very, I'm a very emotional person. When I finish any persona game, I'm like in tears because I'm going to, Oh, I'm going to miss my crew. That's my gang. I've been with them for a hundred <laughs> hours and they fought so hard to defeat evil and uh, all sort of stuff. I mean, that's the case for like, for various reasons. Like just, I get very emotional about game stories. Uh, the thing about space for the unbound is that, the way it talks about family trauma and the way it digs into how different people cope with those situations uh, is what it it was. It's the most thoughtful way to characterize someone going through the things that they went through. Um, And it's very bold. It, It like doesn't necessarily have a happy ending or, well, I mean, depends on your interpretation, but I think, it is the bo- it is the rawest and it is the most honest look at how trauma affects someone and how they carry on from that. And even across books, music, movies, TV shows, anime, other games, I think very few stories 
get it as right as a space for the unbound does. I'm totally with you. I want to like echo just the last part of what you said there, where the the ending, like you said, I, I would argue it is obviously like a happy ending in my books, but I think you're right. It's kind of like one of those, to me, it's also just a real ending where mm, yes. it's so real with the way they tackle it, where once you finish the game and I, I, I my favorite tweet that I put out is like me ugly crying, like over a space for the unbound because I wanted to like, you know, stream it, like react to it. But I think that moment I just recorded myself playing the last few hours of it. Yeah. And it was one of those scenarios where it's like, you're not just crying, you're like bawling out to this game and like just waterworks. But it's also one of those things where when you finish the game, you feel this sense of equal, like, just closure but also mm. deep 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 reflection and like you said it's almost like it's it's not just game like so many pieces of art can do that to you so when it when art does that to you you know it's high art and it's really impactful mm. um and i really didn't expect this coming from um Mojiken, which is again a local studio or a studio out there in indonesia um they have been making games for quite a while but uh i feel like for the most part not a lot of people have been exposed to their previous titles before and for them to come out with this game and to knock it out of the park but also to connect with people all over the world with that type of that deep of a connection is mind-boggling to me yeah. um, so you can really tell you know Dimas we've interacted with Dimas the creator um, uh, many times before but I'm just so proud but also so happy that he was able to convey that to people uh, but yeah A Space Man I think is uh, I, I'll just echo that Michael Reno you wrote an amazing mm -hmm. Um, piece like I said uh, like Michael mentioned for uh, game sub but like what are your thoughts post that conversation that we've also had I just feel like it's um, I guess it's impact like it still felt even though you know released back in January or February like even now we're in July and people are still talking about it um, I don't know if I mentioned this on our last episode but when I was at Bit Summit um, they had um, Moji Ken at a booth and they were selling um, a space with the Unbound merch and like oh. Japanese devs were coming there and buying everything like they were like, oh, can I have one of everything, please? Like this, this one particular like studio, and they were like, so moved. They love their like, we love your game so much. We hope our game that we're going to be releasing soon can like live up to the storytelling that you guys have. Yeah, you guys have um, portrayed, and it's just like such a nice feeling. I think especially like us being in Southeast Asia, we're like you know still kind of up and coming in terms of our industry, and then for Japanese developers to be like, we think you guys did it amazingly, and we want to do something like that as well. And also that, you know, they're Japanese, they're, their culture is a little bit different, but they were able to really vibe and relate with the storytelling that um, Dimas and the crew did. So really, really amazing. Um, yeah, super, yeah. super great. And I think what I liked most about the ending, like, like you know how we're, we're kind of talking about, oh, was it a good ending or not? Like, I think it was like the bits where like, you know, some of the characters had done some questionable things and it's not like a happy ending, like, oh, we're all friends together. There were like yeah. some characters is like, yeah, you, you kind of did a shitty thing and like, I might not forgive you yet or not, but you know, there's, it felt very real in that sense where it's like not, not everything gets tied up nicely in the bow and, and that's okay. Yeah, that's like, I think that's the most important, one of the most important messages that the game sends is that no one's entitled to your forgiveness. And I think, you know, I feel like growing up, uh, people always tout like forgiveness as a virtue and like to forgive the people is, show, is a sign of strength. And in some cases, sure, yeah, maybe it is. But in some cases, I like, if you've done something wrong to me and you've done nothing to atone for that, I don't owe you shit. And I think a lot of people, especially when it comes to families, there's like a sense of obligation to forgive someone who's like, you know, blood relative. But honestly, that kind of sometimes that just doesn't mean anything. And uh, and for someone to take advantage of that is like that is also falls under the umbrella of abuse. And it is the way the way this game kind of unfolds that without outright telling you. And I think that's the, one of the smartest things about A Space for the Unbound is that it doesn't it doesn't like put the themes and the storytelling on a platter. You just kind of witness what this person goes through and uh, the ways it you know changes the way they think they interact with the people at with their people at school, how they interact with their mom and um, and, you know, Atma, who is you know, I'm not going to get into what their role is in this all as well, but it kind of all fits together and it just makes sense. And the onus is on the player to piece it together. So when it hits you with those impactful moments, it's yeah, th there's like, it was before the ending, but it was like one of the last sequences, one of the lines of dialogue that um, that's, that's in that in like the dialogue sequence was like that moment where it all clicked and I start to, and then I kind of reflected on the past like five hours I was playing in the game. And I'm like, 
oh my god i get it now like i see why this character is this way why this happened uh and it was just that overwhelming moment where all the pieces clicked into place it was overwhelmed with emotion but at the same time and i said this on another podcast that i was on uh back when i like finished it when i first finished it and i in that moment i felt like there has never been a game that has that I feel like understood me as well as this game does. Like this game kind of captured my own feelings about what I've been through in my life better than I could have ever written myself. And I was just, I, and like when I felt that too, along with the story moments, I was just, I was just like shocked that there's a game that says what it says in the way that it does like a space for the unbound and it is yeah it's it transcends the media itself so uh, i mean the it can only be told through a game i feel like this is one of those where the interactive element is such an important piece of it and why it hits hits hit me so hard um but i think the thing that i love is that the message is universal and it takes place it's so very indonesian at the same time where I feel like I lived in that place for those like five, six, seven hours that I played it. It's, it's so expressive about like where it takes place and the culture. And that comes through so vividly in the actual moment to moment gameplay. But the message you get at the end is universal and anyone can relate to it. Who's been through those things. And I think that's part of like what, Re when Reno mentioned that people went to their booth at bit summit and said, wow, your, your game was amazing. It, like, it transcends the cultural boundaries as well. And uh, while also inviting you to be like, hey, you know, spend some time in our country. Let us show you what we're about and and also stay for this this wild story that you're going to that's going to hit you, too. And it just on all fronts, it's just an amazing achievement. Yeah, I don't know how they did that, like be so innately Indonesian, but at the same time, it's like you if you get it if you recognize it if you're from that culture you feel so seen but if you're not you also feel connected to it in, in a certain way i think a lot of the journalists that were doing the reviews everyone had this moment of like using like anamoa anamoya it was like being nostalgic for something that's never happened yet and i saw that yeah. in like 10 different articles because we all <laughs> felt that we're like we're not actually from this part of indonesia but for some reason it feels like we've been there somehow mm -hmm. yeah and and i think that's oh go ahead michael oh, i was just gonna say also it reminds me a lot of the Philippines too, just because like, you know, Southeast Asia, that part, like we're all islands that are divided, uh, <laughs> like arbitrarily from history. Like the Spanish came through and said, Hey, listen, these islands belong to Spain. I'm like, damn. All right. I guess that's, that's, that's how it is. <laughs> um, but there's still so much cultural crossover, like even like the landscapes. And I felt like I was, you know, at my grandma's house in the Philippines, just because it looks also like the Philippines. But then there's a lot of parallels, um, especially with like character designs and even like some of the language. I mean, Tagalog is or yeah, various languages within the Philippines share some similarities. Like sometimes I see or hear like Indonesian words and I'm like, I feel like I should understand that, but I don't. And then, but there's that <laughs> level of familiarity where it's like, oh, like these are kind of, I can relate to this on some level too. And just like the way the culture is like with different, like there's Muslim representation in uh, that game as well. That's just like, Oh, this is part of this town. There's so many small pieces that uh, like other people will probably play and not necessarily, Oh, just see like, Oh, maybe this is just part of Indonesia culture. Whereas, you know, I understand that there's a lot of uh, Muslim population there as well. And just uh, some of the cultural norms and just the way things look is so, all seems very familiar to me. So, um, yeah, I, I love. It's another thing I love about it. Yeah, I I think like on the representation side, it is like truly one of those moments where you feel so incredibly proud to be from where you are. But it's also funny because, like you said, it is Indonesian, but there's that universal element where there's a one layer where it's like it's for Indonesians, right? But then there's a, that added level where it's for potentially Southeast Asians. But then there's that third level where it is truly universal for people that have experienced the themes of that story or have inter have had interactions with even with some of those NPCs that are just universal interactions. Um, but I think when it comes to like talking about it as a game as well, which is something you brought up that was super interesting, Michael. It's like, it can only exist in a game because that aspect and what you brought up, we know it's like, you feel nostalgic, but it's because of what they do with the game, the music, the aesthetic, the way they put uh, certain sequences in between other sequences. Like that story can really only be told via a video games medium. And that's why I think for me, like a space of the unbound is very special because other than the story, like I feel like some people might hyper-focus on the story, which is 
completely deserve it. Some people might hyper focus on the aesthetics, which is completely deserve it. But the master, the reason why Space for the Unbound is so masterful is that it interlinks everything um, just so seamlessly, and it's a revolving kind of like machine that just keeps going and going and going. That is truly video games. Um, my biggest fear before we move on to it, like maybe some of the other games that we love this year, is that. I don't, I'm not sure how many people have played this game. Like, I don't know how widely covered it's been. I think, Michael, you did some great work, like, shouting out about the game. I think Rebecca Valentine also did a pretty solid yeah. like, interview with Dimas mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Uh, but I, I really want this game to be nominated. Again, it, there's so much bias. Like, I love the folks out there behind the game. But, like, I don't think people understand how great of a flipping game this is. Um, so I hope this conversation does it justice. But outside of the representation side of things, it's like, this is a phenomenal independent video game that is moving and that is truly universal. Um, but I just really hope it gets up there for uh, award contenders outside of like Southeast Asia and outside of the Asian region. Yeah. Um, because I think like flowers where flowers are due, this is like phenomenal, a phenomenal um, piece uh, that contributes to the medium. I think it definitely helps that like the game was like localized in a lot of different languages as well. So it was up for an award at BitSummit too. Um, and then like Dimas got interviewed on stage as well. So th- there's definitely like a lot of work happening behind the scenes to, to make sure it gets the coverage that it deserves. But hopefully this podcast is just one more, one more piece like mm-hmm. for championing yeah. that. Yeah. Man, you started off, you started us off on like a real deep note. Or if we're like, all to. Sitting, you're just like, wow, like going back to our time with the space with the inbound. Yeah. I feel, I'm super honest feelings. with you guys. I feel like really <laughs> emotional. Like I genuinely yeah. like I'm reminded of my, my time there, but um, yeah. that's what video games are. Like, it's like, we have <laughs> these kinds of conversations. Cause like we can talk about the wacky stuff that we experience. And we just did a clip on the toilet paper game, you know, <laughs> like oh, that we released on, the, the <laughs> on our channel, but uh, we'll get to that too, another time. Right? But it's like uh, the fact that video games can have like two huge moments. Like you oscillate between the wacky, the absurd, but also to have real genuine conversations about what, uh, games can do to individuals and the impact that they can have is like I got I had to start off as um, that is start one of the games strong. of the year for us alright oh, so Michael what's one of yours <laughs> so heavy, follow up heavy. follow up uh, uh, <laughs> damn the more the more I think about it, the more I'm like yeah I, I, I definitely I'm there's still a lot more year left. There's a lot more uh, time for me to kind of preach the good word. I'll just let folks know that the Space for the Unbound is such an important game of the year um, but I think uh, when I I keep track of like all the games I play over the year and kind of shuffle them around in rankings, whatever, uh, because at GameSpot we do we have our game of the year voting and then we have deliberations to kind of like hammer out what's our top 10 and then what's our game of the year. And so like everyone on staff uh, puts their votes in and then from there we kind of uh, just see how the votes are tallied up and then we have we talk. So. I do keep track of that stuff. I, I think it's super fun. I love doing that. And one of those games that I'm definitely going to be championing is uh, Octopath Traveler 2. Because, <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, my God. I've been talking about it a lot. And, like, uh, just because, like, I mean, Octopath Traveler 1 had a lot of great ideas. And I feel like folks who weren't turn-based RPG sickos uh, kind of looked at it and said, all right, it's it's one of those. Um but and I had a lot. I had a lot of issues with the first one, or it didn't grab me in the way that I expect an RPG to grab me because I didn't really find the individual stories all that interesting. And the whole conceit about Octopath is that there are eight individual stories that intertwine. And when the eight individual stories aren't that great, then like I need a motivation in RPG. That's what RPGs are all about. It's like okay, you can have a great combat system, but why am I fighting for what it is I'm mm-hmm. fighting for? And Octopath Traveler Two gives you that in like gives you a ton of that like every character has has a purpose and a purpose that you can get behind but also so much personality and i think that that is that is one of the most important elements of two for me is why i i love it so dearly is because i remember all eight of those characters for very distinct reasons yeah, that's awesome yeah it's uh I finished it or I, when i was playing it i'm like oh they are addressing almost everything that i wish one was uh, and that's that's incredible and it is. I, I will say it again. It is the best turn-based combat system of all time. It is wow. so. Wow. <laughs> what a statement! Hey, accolades. Yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, and I like. I grew up playing turn-based RPGs. Still to this day, like, you know, S, I love my SMT games. I love my Persona games, and I love those those combat systems and how they make you account for so many different layers. But. It, they don't, they, I'm gonna say they don't come close to Octopath Traveler too. Um, yeah, it, it's really crazy how they've been able to like build upon the foundation of the first game and throw in a bunch of elements that all fit together. And one of the things I like about it is just that that flexibility. And also, it's important that you fight enemies that are just as challenging. So yeah, I'm not just 
putting together all these super powerful moves and I'm like super OP. And then, well, what, what the, there's no strategic element if the game isn't pushing back on you. And there are some bosses in this game that really, really <sighs> stretch the imagination, like your ability to wield uh, all the class system, the different uh, like abilities that you have, how you can mess with the turn order, um, the special abilities for each individual character. And I think that also is an incredible thing is that each character is like, unique abilities is, is tied to their personality and what who they are and what they're about so there's a lot of a lot of that charisma comes through in the combat as well and it is just one of the most amazing soundtracks of the year for sure mm. uh, like i i also of, often talk about rpg soundtracks and how music is, is such a huge part of a game's personality and it is part of the storytelling it is i remember specific moments because of a melody or a song that played or that character's theme it's such an important piece and every single theme character theme in and boss battle theme in this game and even the overworld themes are so beautiful it is amazing i can't believe that they went this hard on the soundtrack i mean well i was about to travel one that soundtrack was amazing too but yeah. the thing with two is that i care about that world and those characters so that music means more to me um just ah man love yeah i'm going to be fighting for that I, I'm so glad sure. you brought that up because like Octopath is one of those. Ones. I, I I haven't played Octopath 2. I don't think you have either. No, right? I haven't played. Rita? Like Octopath 1, just to echo some of those moments is like, it is kind of, to me, it's like kind of revolutionary. And I don't think people are talking about it in the way that I think it kind of deserves in some ways where it's like, it kind of it, like that 2D, 3D, what do they call it again? Like that HD 2D, is 2D HD 2D, right? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like the first, I think, major game that came out in that yeah. style. And then now you're seeing a lot more um, uh, in that vein, but it just kind of works where it marries modern game design and mechanics with something that is old and nostalgic in a way, mm -hmm. while also, also like, becoming its own thing within itself but i think you're right like i loved octopath which is super weird i played like what 80 70 80 hours of that game the first yeah, one sounds right yeah. but I, I never finished it and it's one of those things where the only reason why i didn't finish it is because some of the character stories kind of like fizzled out towards the end where i'm like i don't think you guys are interacting in the way that i need you to and like to like go into this like <laughs> Yeah. semi-final battle um but the moments that i had was like i remember primrose story and octopath one so like just so well and i loved it, what they did there so the way that people are describing octopath and almost like how you are michael it's like if you're telling me that is elevated and that is like it's for all the other characters as well um it just gets me so flipping excited this is one of those cool. ones where i have to put it as like uh I, I need to play i knew i was i was gonna play it but every single time somebody talks about octopath 2 it's like they flipping love that game yeah so, yeah um <laughs> It's awesome, but uh, Reno, you don't have any like uh, it, like. Have you seen a lot of like Octopath hype like in Japan? Because when I was there in Tokyo when it launched, the first they one, were, yeah, the first one, they were really hyping up the, the first Octopath game. There was a little bit, but I don't think I think it kind of just gets lost in the noise a lot. Like that's just in, like another separate conversation about like games promotion or anime promotion in Japan. Like it's everything is everywhere. You just kind of lose track of things. Like even like I think a couple of weeks ago I was sharing with you like Final Fantasy 16 had the the gacha thing at Seven Eleven, so you can like get a chance to win. Like it could be like a really beautiful figure of Shiva, or it could be like another like or like a sticker. Like literally, like that's the range. <laughs> Um, but like it just comes and goes and people just kind of, yeah, but I, I do remember seeing some Octopath stuff there in Japan, but, um, just, just a quick, I, I do need to derail this conversation slightly because Michael, <laughs> you're like, so you were like super passionate talking about the combat system in, in RPGs. And I just need to ask like, what, like lay, lay it for me, be honest with me. What do you think of the Final Fantasy VIII combat system? With, with Final Fantasy VIII? With yes. Draw and Junction? Yes. Uh, I think it's fine. <laughs> I think there it's we go. Cool. That's all we needed. That's all that's I that, needed. That, that's all I need. That's all I need. Okay. Yeah. It's it's cool. <laughs> I, I I I I appreciate its flexibility. I think there is a. You don't have to be nice, Michael. You don't no, have to be no, nice no, for Rita. Because it, <laughs> the hard part, though, is because I feel like it being a game that came out on PS One and nine it was a ninety nine uh, nineteen ninety nine. I think yeah, the tutorialization was not as robust as it was back in the day so i feel like people who jump into eight and don't necessarily get a grasp of the drawn junction junction system just get lost in it and the more you tinker with it be like oh this actually is pretty wild uh for especially you know coming off of seven they're like oh wow we figured out rpgs just keep doing that and they said no nah, we're gonna mess with the combat system again we're gonna do this wild drawn junction thing so i appreciate it i just wish that its complexities were a little bit more uh they just communicated it a little bit better so 
I'd love to see him do it again, though. This is the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Really? Everyone's <laughs> just like, <laughs> yo, it is trash. This is this is literally how RF and I met. Like, uh, like I'm the biggest like <laughs> FF8 fan. It's like my favorite FF8 of all time. And then like I go into a stream, I rate him. I'm like, hey. And then we talk about Final Fantasy, and he's like eight, <laughs> eight. What and does then, like, draw he, injunction then, even mean? You know what I mean? Pulled, like, he, he changes like transition to his like hot takes screen and being like eight is the worst Final Fantasy. And I'm like, t- texting my chat, guys, guys, abort, 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 abort. We got we're leaving now. Oh, <laughs> bad rage, very, bad rage. Very mean. Oh. <laughs> I'm used to it. Everyone tells me it is the well, most controversial Final Fantasy of all time. You've all derailed time. it. You know why I act like that? It's kind of like a tortoise that goes into the shell because whenever I bring up my favorite Final Fantasy, like people give me so much shit for it. So Final Fantasy 13 isn't linear, everybody. If you, I mean, it is linear, but like I can't really defend that one, huh? Like oh, Final Fantasy 13, 13 is a great yeah. game, all right? It so I feel like it's like two people that like love actually Final Fantasy 8 is like I feel like it's a lot more universally loved than 13, than 13. oh yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like it's a reaction to me but I think like the talking about the systems right like I feel like all those games do have like some weirdly innovative systems but I think like I didn't realize that the system for Octop like the battle system for 2 was uh, it sounds like it's even an, an evolution of the first one but also yeah. really makes like full use of it my quick question uh, as somebody who hasn't played it is like actually two quick questions do you think there's going to be a third uh, Octopath cool. game like does it deserve to be a franchise that deserves to keep getting more games but then the second thing is like what uh, out of all of it what is the best part about Octopath is it the story is it the, the gameplay like what is that defining thing with, uh, with Octopath 2 um, first off uh, I I hope there's an Octopath Traveler 3 is in pre-production somewhere at Square Enix um, I would love to see them take another crack at it because it's it's not perfect of course there's still some things that I think that uh, as I play the game I'm like oh man I wish they did this or that or um, so there's still room for improvement I would love to see them do a third one um, but I think the defining the thing that is ah, damn it's really hard because I feel like everything is at the same level of quality um, but I guess huh I don't know I guess I, I would I would probably put it put it on the the music is the thing for me because i listen to that soundtrack back and that's the that's the glue that holds it all together so i remember the stories i remember how tough i fought in those boss battles and how the music was the mo- like that's the thing that pushed me uh through that game and it just I'm, i remember doing the final boss fight and just having chills because of like the the Latin choirs coming in and like the heavy guitars and the orchestral strings, it it's it does that classic RPG thing of making you feel like this battle between two D pixels is absolutely <laughs> epic and the fate of the world is at hand. So it's the music that gives that game such such a an amazing stage for the battles for the characters to thrive because without it. I don't think I would have been convinced as much to see that game all the way through. Like part of when I went to that last boss battle, I was like, I can't wait to hear what this theme is because they went so hard throughout the rest of the game that they have set the bar so high and they kind of like, you know, keep one one upping themselves. So if anything, like that's the defining feature for me. God, I'm so I'm so excited to play this right now. now. Yeah. Well, that's why we do these episodes, I guess, right? But yeah, like uh, I, the, my biggest word for that is like the music is the glue that holds it together. Because you're so right. I'm thinking about my favorite JRPGs, right? And it is the music like elicits the memories, elicits the Absolutely. like um, the, your your thoughts on the gameplay. So yeah, I, I love that. All right, well, play Octopath too, I guess. Like I don't think people need another reminder, but like, dear God, play. It seems like play Octopath yeah. too. Rito, uh, Octo- other than Octopath too. Give me, give me like one of your, like, uh, yeah, what's on your uh, list? I think it's this like surprises no one, but I am putting Raincoat on my list. Oh, yeah. I was going to, I thought something else was going to precede that, but all right, hit, hit me with the uh, renewed thoughts on Raincoat. Renewed thoughts. It's just in my thoughts. Like every day, every day I'm th- I wake up, I'm like, what are my characters doing? I'm like, oh, that story beat. Like, oh, how that, that oh. went so hard. Um, I, I love, I love Raincoat because it's because of everything that it is, but also what it represents in terms of like an evolution of the Danganronpa series, which is a, a, a franchise I really, I really hold dear to my heart. And also the fact that it managed to change my mind because going, when they first announced it, I think me, myself and a lot of the Danganronpa community were just like, where's our Danganronpa for, you know, like we don't want this. It looks like it, but we don't want this. We want more of the same thing. Um, but then 
the whole team, the whole like Spike Chunsoft and like Tokyo Productions team are just like, like, wait, like, let us cook, you know, like, let, let us <laughs> yeah. figure this, yeah, let us figure this out. And then you play it and you're like, exactly. Like, I totally see what you're trying to do with um, improving the mini game mechanic, taking the visual novel franchise uh, genre forward and making it more accessible to people who are probably normally like of us or allergic to, to reading too much in games. It definitely answers a lot of things. Uh, also, like what you're saying with, with Octopi, like this is not a perfect game, but it's it's definitely a, a case of like, I see what you were trying to do and what and what you were trying to convince us to do. And I really agree with it. I agree with this direction you're going. And I hope that this game is really successful and it inspires them to continue more. Because just like with Danganronpa, you know, they, they wrap up the story, but there's, there's a lot more that's untold that, that will make a really great Raincoat 2 and so on. So just just a wonderful game. Another one of those where I just like, I want to erase my memory and, and start over, Aww. just play it again. Yeah. yeah. Have you played Raincoat, Michael? Are you because like are you uh, no. from what I got from our previous conversation? You're, you're Dong and Rampa person. Uh, yeah. I, I, well, I've I played through Dong and Rampa one. Uh, I haven't played two or V three, uh, but uh, I'm I'm also aware. Like I have a lot of friends who are like Dong and Rampa sickos. Uh, so like when Raincoat <laughs> came around, they're like, "Yo, Raincoat is here. Code for Raincoat is here." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, I'm happy for you, man." <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's exactly like what I <laughs> literally word for word. That's what I said. Through. I'm happy for you. I'm so oh, happy for you. Yeah. Yeah. Do your thing. Do your thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, like Kodaka is oh that 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 dude is wild. So him, him so Kodaka and um, uh, Uchikoshi are just like two developers who are like born of the same mind, where they just do the most wild stuff in their <laughs> games, and no one else is doing it like them. And like you also have like folks like Swery and Suda, but kind of on a on a more like on a, in a different lane. Uh, like those are two minds who kind of like are drawn to like the the wild and wacky minds of like Twin Peaks and just that kind of drama, um, things like that. And then uh, then you have like Kodaka and and Uchikoshi who are just like mystery driven games that are just plot twists that you cannot even tell like until like the very last minute until they hit you with it. It's uh, their games just they. When it comes to like plot twists and character arcs and uh, overall themes, I don't think there are developers who or think on their level. They're just on a di- they're on a different level with with the stuff that they pull off in their game. So I have like a ton of respect uh, for uh, for I I, was, I I play a lot more of Uchikoshi's games uh, more so than Kodaka, but I think uh, they both like deserve their flowers. I think um, something I mentioned on the previous episode, I think with Arif was like. They take, they understand their community so well, and they take that and sort of use it against you in a way, in a, in a good way in the game. Like, I don't want to spoil anything, but it's like they they understand that we've been with them for this long. They understand that we've played previous franchises. And then you're sitting in that comfort zone of understanding how they work. And then at the end, they like, they like do a big twist and it's like, well, it's been staring at you the whole time. Like, why didn't you realize yeah. it? And it's like, well, you told us this was this was how you make your games. Like, that's how I felt at the end. I'm like, is this so smart? But also, I'm like, kind of mad at you for like, <laughs> you knew you knew what kind of mindset I was in. That's how you were able to trick me. Um, yeah. And then the second thing is like, yeah, Kodaka is like weird, man. Like, I was watching all these <laughs> interviews, and so one of the game mechanics um, in Rain Code is where you're using solution keys um, to refute statements so you're in that similar to Dangarampa, right like you're using bullets to to shoot people um shoot their statements so in the game you shoot solution keys but you get the solution keys from shinigami like the the hot girl that's following you and mm-hmm. she vomits them up and like in the interview the the i think it was like with the five guys you're like hey there's a lot of vomiting in this game and kodaka's like yeah i really like that like maybe i liked it too much like that's why it's everywhere <laughs> It's like, all right, dude. has got an auteur, man. You know, hey, yo, that's, that's funny. Like, I, I I've interviewed Uchikoshi also in the lead up to like the Somnium Files games, and he was he's very similar. Where I'll ask him like a question, and you like go off the rails. And I was like, oh yeah, you got this uh, this V or not VTuber, but like uh, this character A said she's like a she's a streamer in the game, like. And so they they pitched this interview as like, oh, you get to interview Uchikoshi and the character A set. And I'm like, the character, not the the voice actor. Like, no, 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 no. She's an actual person. 
She's an actual person. I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I'll play along. I'll play along. And I was like, this is really weird that you're having a character like do this interview. Uchikoshi, like, tell me more about that. And he's like, yo, listen, if you just down like three bottles of vodka and get in the tub and take a nice, <laughs> hot, warm bath, you'll accept the idea of having this, this pop star in our game as a real person <laughs> in your life, too. And I'm like, I guess I'm publishing this. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you have to at that point. It's like, yeah, it was it was incredible. One of the best interviews still. <laughs> I, I like Swimming Falls. I haven't finished it yet because it's such a long game, but I was like streaming it with, with my community who've, who've all played it. And like there's this part where it's like, talk to the receptionist. I'm like, okay. Oh, my and God. I, again, I'm like, again, again, again. You know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. The dialogue just gets more and more. So, like for for our benefit, like the the receptionist is a very well endowed person, and the more you talk to her, the more descriptive the the <laughs> you, your character gets. I see. I see. Uh, yeah, it's uh, these dudes yeah. are. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you yeah, think, they, man? They got to do their. Thing. <laughs> they got to yeah, do their yeah. thing. I'm I'm really excited by that. I I love how that was your pick as well, though, Rita. Just like talk about it in a high level, right? Because it does seem like one of those like grassroots kind of like I feel like Danganronpa is like such a word of mouth thing where it just percolates and then it like fills up and then you just hear about like the Danganronpa series, right? So I'm curious to see where Raincoat kind of like fits into the overall narrative here. But it's so cool. I, we've had this kind of conversation where creators have already created like what would seem to be their masterpieces in this industry, but now they're kind of like iterating on it or like this the whole spirit successor concept which i think i brought up like ken levine and like what is bioshock like what is um, his new judas which is like the bioshock successor right so i think like in the similar vein i'm really excited to see where these creators go with new ip if you will but are still homages to their uh notable pieces of work so that's my exciting part about like where this industry is headed to um but maybe we can move on to like some of the other games, like a briefer conversation about some other games we want to shout out here for like games that um, are either deserved of 2023, 2023 game of the year or just some of the best things that we've played. Um, I'll transition to like a quick one about one that caught like slapped me in the face when it was like, Ooh. hey, or if I can't like we're going to shove so much quality at you that you're not expecting and subvert your expectations. Uh, and that game is Honkai Star Rail. Um, by yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. So, I've said this so many times on this podcast. Like Reno is the Genshin person. I'm so not the Genshin person. I'm so not the Gacha person. Genshin was kind of there for me. I booted up Hawkeye Star Rail last week after not playing it for a while, and I'm mind blown of the quality at which they operate. Like the UI, um, kind of even the animations in their UI is just like you're at the top of your game. I don't see like you know the companies that I love and respect who I um, associate to quality video game work to have this kind of sophistication with video games, um, but I just wanted to throw that out there as like Honkai Star Rail was a sleeper hit for me and it's huge. Obviously, it's making so much money, but like I'm so shocked how much I fell in love with that game and I'm still surprised how much I am in love with that game and I want to play... I, 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 it's so weird. I want to play it every day, like still. And uh, to me, that's insane. <laughs> oh. um, Michael, have you played... Uh, are you a Genshin person? Are you a Honkai person? Are you a uh, I, I've tried, tried to get, in, get into Genshin multiple times and just kind of... I, I, I like the aesthetic of Genshin. I like the vibe of that world. Uh, but there's just something I didn't really wrap my head around the idea of like I play Final Fantasy 14 um, and that is the that is the only like ongoing game that I can like really commit to. So I had a commitment issue with Genshin. I'm sorry. Um, those pre- <laughs> those pre- me. Yeah, I mean, me. I tried to get into 14, but I was still playing Genshin. And I was like, I, I only <laughs> yeah, have enough yeah, like, room for one. Yeah. The oh, yeah. But Honkai yeah. Star Rail was I felt, I felt like when I when I jumped into it, it felt more digestible. Like here's a single player story, and just experience that. And if that's what you experience, then that's good enough. And I love, like I said, I love turn based combat systems. So when I was like, oh, Honkai Star Rail is a turn based RPG, I'm like, hell yeah, let's let's give it a shot and let, let's see what's up. And the the so you mentioned also the surprising quality, and I and I think that's one of the the one of the biggest hooks for me is that oh, I didn't expect, you know. A, a you know f- from Hoyoverse to invest like they of course they want to make a, a good game or whatever and they want they want you to they want money right so it's like yo mm-hmm. primo gems well guess what we got star rail passes here <laughs> and so i'm like okay yes, listen i get it that's that's the kind of game that they make uh but i think the stories on the ground level with the characters and like the the dynamics that the social dynamics that that world paints was like oh this is actually some pretty thoughtful writing in this game that is trying to juice money out of me right um <laughs> so yeah even though i'm just like playing it as a normal rpg i it's hitting the notes that i look for in my single player rpgs and um yeah i i, I love it for that too 
Yeah, it's it's a great story. The music is also really good. Um, one of my um, friends was telling me that the if, I don't know if you've had if you guys have hit the Coca-Cola battle. I think it's one of like the first bo- boss battles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like um, it's like screamo music. It's like like heavy yeah. metal music. Yeah. And I was playing at my friend's local gym in Malaysia. Like everyone was just so on the Honkai train that like the even the people at the gym were like we're gonna we're gonna blast Honkai music and it's gonna like, inspire <laughs> to like lift heavier. Hell it's like yeah. super funny. Yeah, <laughs> I think my only challenge with star rail is because i kind of stopped playing for a few weeks as well similar to rf just got busy with life and things like that and coming back into it um i like i don't have as much issue with the gacha like you know it's it's it is what it is and especially for the characters i understand that but with farming for materials it that that is what like kind of pisses me off a little bit because yeah. it's i think it's even harder than genshin the grind like ba- just based on like the numbers that you're given like the allocation of like how much you can do in a day and it's just like i remember this i've done this for three years with genshin do i really want to do this for like uh, another three years at star Rail? it's like mm-hmm. i'm going to spend like one of my friends has spent like a year and a half in this particular domain in genshin looking for this one crit rate hat oh my and like God. every like every day he's he's going in and allocating like 80 percent of resources to farm this piece and it's like another day no crit rate hat another day no crit rate hat and that's that's like me with like star Rail at the moment where i'm trying to i've got like some nice characters are like but they don't have the right equipment and you can't just get it you just you just have to like pray that it that it drops for yeah. you today it's like uh that that yeah. part's really tough but the story itself is is really wonderful and they fixed a lot of the things that I think Genshin players had issues with. So Honkai is like a, like a nicer experience in that sense. So yeah, yeah I, I can't describe it enough. If you haven't played Genshin and you've like turned away from it, you should try out Honkai Star Rail. And that's what like got me hooked. Uh, Michael, what's a, what's a tra- oh. transitioning here? We're getting on the train to the next stop, the Astral yeah. train to the next stop. Hit, hit me with a, another game that you think is deserved of like a game of the year uh, uh, kind of like conversation. Yeah, I, I there's I play a lot of I have to play a lot of AAA stuff just because like for coverage uh, for the site. Um, but even though I think Final Fantasy 16 uh, is it's divisive for sure, and I get why. And but for me, I think like I it's like I, I don't need to get into it because I feel like I, I previewed the game twice and then I reviewed mm-hmm. it and then I was on a bunch of like post review <laughs> podcast talking about. It. So I feel like I've talked about this game to death. Um, so, and I don't have that much left to, to share, but I think as the year goes on, I can see how it might get lost in the sauce in terms of like the broader game of the year discussion. But for me personally is I went into the game suspect of like, are they, you know, I love 14, obviously like that development team, it's, they, they got me time and time again with every expansion, every patch update for 14. It's just been like I've been blown away by their work consistently. But what can they do outside of the MMORPG? I'm so curious to see. So when I finally got hands on with the game, I'm like, all right, prove to me that this isn't just you trying to beat Game of Thrones. Um, like, are you going to be able to hit the notes that Final Fantasy, only Final Fantasy can? Um, and they did. They did that. And the, the, like the back half of the game is just I was hooked into the characters, their stories, the struggles that they were going through. And usually I say this a lot is that I'm not usually um, like fancy, big, bombastic cutscenes aren't necessarily necessarily like things that hook me. Like I, I get why those the high production values are so attractive to other people, like only triple A that triple A games can afford. But those aren't necess- like those aren't inherently the things that make a game good. Um, but the way they're able to have that, the, like the really expensive cutscenes with amazing special effects, really using the power of the PS5, that high fidelity, I'm like, okay, what for? And I think the way they frame uh, the most emotional moments in that game through their cutscenes is something I rarely feel in a AAA game. So I felt a very strong connection with its, it hits, it tries to go for a lot of themes doesn't necessarily hit all of them as best as they can but i think that the the theme of brotherhood kind of like really stuck with me and it really hit me again i talk about like family stuff with space for the unbound and and in a in a different sense that final fantasy 16 also framed a piece of like how i think about family and love within your family and well what like brotherhood means to me and what it means to those characters um I think that is one of the most powerful things about 16. Like, yeah, it's a great, it's a great action game. Debatable if it's an RPG at this point, the more (laughs) I think about it, but it's an, it's a great action game. 
Uh, it is extremely well made. You could tell they put a lot of heart and soul into so many different things. I love the characters, but that is one of the many things that uh, that really stuck with me. And, and when I was done with the game, I'm like, yes, this is deserve it of the Final Fantasy name, and it is up there with some of my favorites in the series. It's amazing. RF was uh, 16 also on your yeah. On your it's it's really weird because I think it's um it's funny you asked me that in that way, right, Reno? It's like, is it still like up there? Yeah, especially post high, right? After you, you know, we're done with the review, we're like a little bit removed. I'm working a little bit on the platinum right now. You see a little bit of the cracks in the game. I think the more removed you are, which is like Absolutely, I'm still yeah. high on the game, but like wow there was uh, like a couple really big missed opportunities on, on my sense i just want to give like the quick note is like jill's character like i just wanted that to be like a bit just a little bit more there and it's just like i feel a little bit unsatisfied but i think just as a note on 16 is like to me it, it is so final fantasy and i've said this on the podcast before but yeah. it's one of those ones where i think about that ending like almost every day at this point after yeah. finishing it and it is the whole game is about legacy and to, uh, like what does it mean to be a final fantasy game is also i think what it's also trying to present and argue but Final Fantasy 16 is one of those games where what it, it's unfathomable that they were able to accomplish this after 14. But the beauty about 14 and to me was that like it evolves as it goes uh, the longer you play the game or the more they iterate on it. What is Creative Business Unit 3 going to do with their next like third person action RPG, whether it be a mainline Final Fantasy or not? Like that's what gets me so excited because if they're hitting on multiple of like you know firing on cylinders that they're firing on for 16 i can only imagine what an evolution of that is going to be so final fantasy 16 makes me more hopeful for the direction of final, Fan final yeah. fantasy as well and that's my takeaway of like why it deserves to be on there for uh like a game of the year conversation mm -hmm. um man i bought i cried so much at that <laughs> oh me too, still think about it, i didn't expect like, it too yeah because uh, like at first like oh yeah medieval fantasy kingdoms exactly. and I'm like ah okay that stuff's interesting <laughs> but that's like where's where's the where's the feelings and then they're like oh yeah. okay yeah well guess what Get through the rest of the game and we'll see about that. <laughs> they really, they got me so many times. But yeah. yeah. That's a, it's a beautiful game. I was going to say more people should play. Like everybody's playing yeah, <laughs> yeah, 16 yeah. on PlayStation. Yeah. <laughs> Rita, what is, a, what is a game out there that's uh, that deserve, de deserve it of a shout out here? Deserve a shout out? Um, I've got a couple that I'm actually looking forward to. Do we want to kind yeah, of let's Yeah, let's that? rapid fire. Let's oh. do some like games that we're excited for for the rest of the year. So this one's already out. It's just me that hasn't played it yet. But um, <laughs> Hello Kitty Island Adventure. No way. No <laughs> way. That's on your list. Where did that, that come from? That is on from? my list. Okay, so I like I saw the trailer a while back. I was like, haha, meme, kind of cute. But then I read Leah. So Leah Williams also writes for Games Hub and she did a review about it and she called it Animal Crossing Meets Breath of the Wild. And I'm like, <laughs> Hello. Wow. Hello, I'm here. I'm I'm listening. And it's just it looks so cute. It looks but it looks so polished as well. It's got some really great characters, all the Sanrio people that you know and love, like My Melody and, and Hello Kitty. I know you guys are staring at me like, what No, the give me hell those like doing? cinema roll shrines, you know what I mean? Like I'll do oh. I'll do any of those. She's got they've got Red Skull in it from a Red Skull. I don't know if you guys oh, have seen yeah. that. But it, yeah. yeah, so she so she's in it and she's like one of my favorite characters from from the Sanrio franchise. It sounds like there's like some puzzles, there's like, you know, bug catching, fishing, exploration. Um, there's apparently a kind of a mystery that you need to uncover on the island. And my favorite part is that in August, there will be a little Twin Stars DLC. So you will have Kiki and Lala in the game. <laughs> no recognition in both of your eyes. It's fine. You can look it up later and you That's can thank up. me later. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited to play Hello Kitty Island Adventure. Shout out to Leah for cluing me on a great, great review. <laughs> I didn't see that coming at all. I, I'm a bit like I love Cinema Roll, but like I did not see that coming at all. Like we've never talked about Hello Kitty personally and on this podcast. So like God bless, God bless you. <laughs> yeah, I have a trying I have a trying over there just out of frame that you've just never seen, basically. All right, yeah. what both of you? What are what are some of your games that you're looking forward to? I don't know, Michael, what, what are some what are some on your list, I guess? Ooh, the the back half of this year is loaded with stuff that is targeted towards me like uh i think persona 5 tactica is gonna be oh that's gonna be a sleep right i, I feel saw like you, you've tattooed oh you've got yeah I got tattoo. a persona that is so tattoo. cool oh. i've been staring yeah. at it like, here, oh, like yeah whoa, so i got I uh it was actually i got uh the, all this done um right before a pandemic mm -hmm. and I, I so it's not finished uh so there's supposed to be like a whole persona theme sleeve um <laughs> so but yeah <laughs> Yeah, Persona, Persona, it's pretty good. I don't know. I kind of, I kind of like, kind of like Persona games, but uh, um, I think uh, there's, I, I do feel like there's an element, uh, like at least not for me, but uh, in a broader sense, that there's a bit of uh, fatigue with Persona Five in particular. 
but I'm just like, yo, give me more. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, so <laughs> a ta- like a tactics, because they've never done a tactics game. So and I, I see like the footage where I'm like, oh, they're using those turn-based elements I know from the RPGs. They're incorporating them to like mm-hmm. it's grid-based, turn-based game. I'm like, oh, that's so smart. It's so genius. I can't believe they're just doing it now. And the, yeah, the new character looks amazing like the 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 the, not just like the the p5 aesthetic but the way they're kind of incorporating the persona q chibi art style uh and that you know new persona 5 game means there's more persona 5 music let's (laughs) go (laughs) oh man i'm so excited for that also uh the new yakuza game the like a dragon gaiden the man who erased his name i think that's uh i love kazuma kiryu I'm, i'm glad that his story is not technically finished after after yakuza 6 and i'm just i eat i eat up rgg games like every like give me more man like they're they're <laughs> masters they are masters at creating drama the drama in those games are just unmatched now i'm just like i already played ishin this year give me more man like keep it coming i know they got this one they got eight but this year i'm really looking forward to what they're doing with that and i guess the other one oh is super mario rpg remake that is a game that i finished oh, 30 times as a kid wow yeah for a long time that was the only game i had i was like five or six years yeah, old. yeah that makes sense so and I'm like, what am i doing for the whole summer i guess i'm gonna beat some mario rpg for the fifth time this week uh, <laughs> or this month maybe and yeah, shit i don't know but that one i'm a little bit more i'm i'm just curious rather than like super hyped on it because yeah like, something... are, you, are you like really excited for it because like it, it, i feel like it is one of those like it's a remake right like there's like complete, yeah. it looks so much different than uh just a high high textured version of it yeah and, yeah and i that game is super like super Mario rpg is surprisingly really really funny that game is really goofy it has so much personality <laughs> and i that comes through in the pixel art and the animation the music so i don't know if if this is like a one-to-one faithful remake of that, I don't know if it's going to hit the same just because, you know, the SNES, the 16-bit aesthetic is such a unique and specific thing. I almost wish they did like an HD 2D version of Super Mario RPG rather than like overhauling it and have it giving it sort of more or less like a Link's Awakening kind of uh, veneer yeah, to yeah. it. But um, I'm still going to play it and I'm just like, I can't believe after all this time they're bringing it back so that's one i'm definitely keeping my eye on as well give me that yokoshi Mamora soundtrack you know oh like my I said, God. she's coming she's back just give me more yeah. of that music she's a it's legend <laughs> the um uh, the games that are on my list it's like because sea of stars is on uh the one to watch for me where i feel like i mean most people are anticipating that as like one of the indies that are coming out this year especially if you love like chrono trigger if you love like that style of jrpg and all that kind of stuff so sea of stars is kind of the obvious like i'm peering uh, i'm I'm peeking at it um but goodbye volcano high was one that i feel Ooh, like again um but that is your game yeah it just seems like such a me game i just want more of this like it looks like a cartoon and i I know we didn't talk about Hi-Fi Rush this episode, but like uh, that kind of style and that kind of feeling Saturday is like coming back. Vibes. Yeah, Saturday yeah. morning cartoon vibes. Like this, it just looks like you're playing a cartoon and it also mm-hmm. got that Life is Strange energy, which is what I love. So goodbye, Volcano High, Sea of Stars. And a weird one for me is I've never been excited for a Bethesda game and they've never caught me, but Starfield, I feel like I need to just lose myself into that. So that's my AAA plus like the indie side mm-hmm. of things where it's just stacked, man. I, I can't believe we didn't talk about Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. Like, oh, yeah. There's, that, oh, yeah. Like, well, that game. It's just, I feel like it's universally <laughs> that indie. Like, yeah, that tiny <laughs> game. But like, I, the reason why I didn't bring it up because like, I haven't finished it yet, but it's like mm-hmm. still there's so much to play and there's so much to experience. But this year is just getting like more and more stacked. Yeah. yeah i'll drop two more so um another game i saw at bit summit was uh eternites which is um oh, yeah. by studio sai so it, it looks like persona it plays it's like they're selling it as like more of a dating sim heavy game so dating sim plus like the sort of action rpg element to it but the cutscenes look really good they look like proper like 2d anime animation um and then the developer was at bit summit talking about you know how he got inspired by the game and why does that dating element in this post-apocalyptic world and he's like what else are you gonna do when the world is ending you're gonna date <laughs> date some people that's and a I good love answer that. <laughs> and the last one which i don't know if it'll be out this year i guess it probably won't but i noticed that Hoyaverse is going to Gamescom and they announced their lineup of games, including Zenless Zone Zero. Oh, yeah. So, so I don't think that will be out this year, but I hope they'll drop like a release date at that time. And this is probably mm-hmm. the first that they've properly showcased that game. I don't know much about it. It looks like it's set in kind of like an 
urban fantasy, again, action RPG. Characters look really cool. There's a, there's a furry character in there, which I think everyone's excited for. So yeah, I'm hoping they'll release more information that soon. I'm ready to lose more money, I guess. Like, I, I guess it'll happen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, Lord. I mean, I, it's just kind of like a crazy episode because I know we're coming at the cusp of it here, but like, you know, Diablo 4 was another one that like mm-hmm. came out and made a lot of waves, but it's like, there's only so much that captures like an individual's moments and like that you really want to champion, which is one of those things. But um, I'm just so excited. I mean, I'm kind of heartbroken. I didn't get to speak about Digimon World Next Order, which was going to be my sleeper hit <laughs> game of the sleeper year. Sleeper hit game of the year. <laughs> but regardless... Um, this was a really lovely conversation about like, it's just so interesting to hear your guys' perspectives on the games that impacted us, both on an emotional sense, but also on a mechanic sense, but also mm-hmm. kind of like how we, th- what we think these games have an impact on in the industry as well. So that's why I love these kinds of conversations. But um, Michael, maybe a question for you and also a layup to yeah. kind of like pimp anything out on your side is like, what do you, th- like just a brief, what do you think the game of the year discussion is going to be like at this yeah. year? What are your thoughts on like game of the year um, yeah. before kind of like uh, you pimp that something? of the stuff that we'd love to pimp out yeah um the i think everyone is pretty much universally in love with Bre- uh, breath of the wild tears of the kingdom and i think it's seeing a similar thing in 2017 because i was i was at GameSpot in 2017 also when breath of the wild and the switch had just come out and it's just like that not only is it universal praise for the game but it's also the game that everyone played as well because that that's a huge factor in how sites and how organizations determine game of the year is like okay what did the panel of people actually play and you know when you you can look at all these amazing games that got high scores like that the people who play them absolutely love them but out of all of those which ones did the most people actually play? And, you know, when you get into how voting systems work, it's kind of like, well, OK, maybe like 50 percent of the this block played Final Fantasy 16 and maybe another 50 percent of this block of voters uh, like all played Starfield or whatever. Uh, but 100 percent of them sure as hell played Tears of the Kingdom. Mm. And it's just it's the game that everyone it's like across the board. If they've touched that game, it feels like that is even even if they haven't finished it. That game is so good about showing you why it's revolutionary so early on. And I think that's that's plays into its advantage. And just I mean, it's 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 a Zelda game. So it's Nintendo's big hit of the year, uh, maybe big hit of this, like of the next five years, you know, mm-hmm. no shade to whatever Mario has cooking up next or any of the other first party stuff that I might uh, be gravitating towards as well. But Zelda, it feels like an event. It's the same way like Elden Ring was last year where mm-hmm. This game is part of the conversation always. You don't just play it and then people talk about it and then maybe they'll remember it when we talk about Game of the Year later on or whatever. Zelda is always in the consciousness and I think it has that that sort of cultural impact <clears throat> impact in the games industry and people who maybe only play one or two or three games a year. So it's kind of like when Elden Ring came out last year, I was like, people back home, who never played a Souls game, never doesn't even know what from software is or ever touch a yep. uh, Dark Souls game. They're deep in Elden Ring and seeing things that fighting bosses that I could never beat. And uh, it's kind of that similar, similar thing where just like everyone is playing Tears of the Kingdom and across the board. Uh, that's kind of it, it's I think the it's the it's going to be game of the year for most people, I I think, and most uh, like award shows. But I think the more interesting conversation, at least from my side, is like, what is the rest? What does the other top five look like? What's the mm-hmm. top 10 sure. going to look like? Because now, now that I look at all the other games coming out this year, all the games that everyone's been praising through the first half of the year. And now I'm like, damn, is Final Fantasy 16 even going to be in the top 10 conversation yeah. at this point? Like, that's how crazy. Gr- yeah, just crazy. Like, this year is been how amazing. Great has been. Yeah, it's been an amazing year, but I still think Tears of the Kingdom is kind of that's that's the one that everyone's going to be rallying behind throughout the rest of the year. Like my sister's playing Tears of the Kingdom. She doesn't play it like she barely plays games. You know? Yeah, like, yeah, it's a the good barometer. Yeah. All right, well, I'm excited. To, that was like, <laughs> oh, sure, like, yeah, great. No, like, no, I that. That's just yeah, like, yeah. Like, that's game of the year, everybody. No, that's the, yeah, that's yeah. the whole end of the episode. Like, it is just Tears of the Kingdom at the end of the day. It's yeah, like, we, forget we, all our previous we conversations. We spent an hour talking about yeah. our favorite games, but you know what? We must <laughs> surrender. We must surrender to Zelda. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. 
<laughs> with that michael thanks for joining us on the 20 podcast like genuinely man like i feel like the thoughts so are much. just so like you know, being somebody covering games and being somebody who like has interviewed a lot of folks but also has a lot of like appreciation for the uh, industry and the ecosystem it's always so refreshing getting uh perspectives like again from a different part of the world although you have obviously you know we've made that southeast asian connection mm-hmm. um it's just a reminder that this this uh, industry is like really a global celebration of like an art form and you can appreciate it through multiple lens no matter where you are in the world but like your Absolutely. reflections here just like puts a lot of perspective into like like man like i'm hyped up for octopath too, <laughs> too. like oh, again yeah. like god damn it you know what i mean like you should just put you in the trailer like to get to get people hyped for it yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. oh man oh boy well you know your boy needs a check so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do, do those like square enix interviews yeah, yeah. Oh, but where, what uh what do you what do you want to promote here like because like like um yeah, the stuff that you write is obviously like uh, I see that I don't know what like on a daily basis at this point, like stuff yeah, that you're putting yeah. out. But like, uh, where can people like keep up? But like, what's coming up for you? Ooh, uh, well, you can follow follow me and all of my stuff at Michael P. Hyam on Twitter. That's mainly where I I just I mess around. I'm, I'm not. Sometimes I have something thoughtful to say, but these days I feel like the Twitter space has just devolved into whatever the hell it is devolving into. Uh, but that is still like the platform where I uh, I talk my talk. Mainly Instagram uh, at Hi I'm Michael, which is just my name. Uh, but at GameSpot.com, I think we uh, we do a lot of great work. There's a lot of, I mean, video game websites have changed in many ways to where you know page views are very important, uh, revenue is very important. That's how we kind of like you know. I guess I hate saying like keep our lights on, but that is the reality of the business. Uh, but within that is still a lot of thoughtful writing when we have the time, when we have the opportunity, those things, we want to make sure that those things haven't got lost. So a lot of my colleagues are just doing great work, uh, out there, um, talking about games in ways that the like, same thing with like my friends at I, IGN, you mentioned Rebecca Valentine, who, uh, is a close friend of mine. I'm going to be at her in her wedding party, which is kind of crazy, like how <laughs> small the industry is. So it just feels like all of my friends, like my actual real life friends, or all the ones who are doing great work across these sites and on their own platforms. Um, like I live with, with Blessing Adioye Jr. And like I'm, I'm able to like kick it with kind of funny so often because he's just like one of my best friends also. So I, I, I guess I was supposed to promote stuff, stuff about me. No, but I'm just like, like, like yo, yeah. I just, yeah. <laughs> like, um, but acceptance speech right now. But no, that's awesome. Yeah. You're, you're, you're everywhere, Michael. And we're like super grateful that uh, you're spending some time with us. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a great vibe. Uh, I really really appreciate it i mean i am on a podcast for GameSpot called after dark where we we talk about yes. games but we also we also bullshit around a lot as well so uh, <laughs> yeah that's uh that's kind of mainly the platform in which i i speak about my week and my day along alongside a lot of my friends there but um yeah other than that i mean uh yeah that's uh not too not, not anything specific to uh promote because um yeah i have to, i have to do a lot of the the what's the word what's the proper word i'm looking for not the dirty work dirty work is no that, that implies <laughs> shady things but you're, you're uh, like just, bearing yeah. bodies in your spare time <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I just i have to do a lot of the uh the core editorial work to make the site yep. uh you know keep going but uh other than that i think uh you know just pay attention to what what we're doing on that site and all my friends there. So, uh, but also, you know, if you're listening to the 20 M podcast and you haven't subscribed or left a review, five star <laughs> ratings, you know, say whatever platform you're listening on, make sure you hit this podcast with five stars, leave a review. You you are really looking for that sponsorship, kind of like you're practicing the like <laughs> that. Got, <laughs> just pay it. Michael to do the sponsorship. Yeah. 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 Listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, no. Again, again, really appreciative. But it's like the beauty of you know having people from the larger entertainment coverage space, but also ha- like talking about some of the folks, not just like uh, us, but some other like local content creators, like up and coming mm-hmm. content creators, but also like local publications and everything. Like read more, uh, watch more, consume more um, for coverage because like there are some phenomenal thoughts that are coming from folks all over the world and all over Absolutely. different publications. So yeah. and they're all like beautiful people too. So yeah, like Games yeah. Hub. Shouts out to my boy Edmund Tran. I always want to give him a shout oh, out. He's real the quick. best. <laughs> Oh, that, that is, is my best. brother. Oh, I love that. Yeah, they've but. started a TikTok, and I just love seeing <laughs> oh, no. him. <laughs> oh, no, it's probably right. <laughs> you, have to, you have to check it out. Oh, that's yeah. cute, oh, man. <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, thanks for listening to the 20 Year Podcast. Everybody. Again, major, major love to Michael. Thanks for coming on. Uh, go follow, go read, go consume, like I said. But like, uh, major, major love to you, man. This is such a lovely conversation. Ah. Reno. Chris. Yes. 
Yes. Uh, what did we do on the last podcast episode? If people want to keep listening to um, the 20 M shenanigans. I hate this pop quiz. Hate what did we do last, in the last episode? We talked about Bit Summit. We talked about Bit Summit. There we Bit go. Summit. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> the queen of Bit, Bit Summit, Reno, like just <laughs> laid it down with all the games that you guys need to play. And we got emotional. We got wacky. And there's some like indie games that I think you're going to be hearing about over the next couple of years that we covered on uh, on that show. So go, so give some, give some indie some loves, man. Yep, check out our previous episode. All right, bye, folks. All right, thanks. <laughs> Peace. Peace out. <laughs>